Tom, and welcome to all of you who have tuned in. Uh, the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, now in its 12th year, began doing webinars on the subject two years ago. To date, we've done 43 of these. They have all been recorded and are available to you uh, if you'd like to look in on them. The webinar featuring Sam Sokol today couldn't be more timely, unfortunately. Uh, it's the first, by the way, of 10 new webinars we're doing in this series. They'll run through the fall and into the early winter. We specifically asked Sam to lead off this series. His subject couldn't be more timely, unfortunately. As we all know, six months ago, the world changed, and not for the better, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The war is ugly, it's brutal, and it continues and shows no sign of fading any time soon. Uh, it's of great contemporary relevance uh, in all kinds of ways. We'll hear about some of those from our speaker. Sam Sokol is eminently qualified to address this topic. Uh, born in America, he now lives in Israel. He's a writer for Haaretz, um, has written before for the Jerusalem Post, for Times of Israel, and other sources as well. I had the pleasure of meeting Sam during a visit of my own to Israel a few years ago, and we've remained in touch, I'm happy to say. I also learned a great deal from reading his recent book, uh, which is exactly on this subject. I highly recommend it to all of you, Putin's Hybrid War and the Jews, Anti-Semitism Propaganda, and the displacement of Ukrainian Jewry. Um, Sam Sokol knows this subject firsthand from many visits to Ukraine, from endless conversations with the parties affected. He keeps up with it. He writes about it on a continuing basis. We're all sure to learn a great deal from him. Sam, I'm happy now to turn over to you. Thank you very much, Alvin. It's a pleasure and uh, I appreciate you having me. Uh, so this topic, as you said, is unfortunately very relevant now and highlights, the, the current conflict highlights some of the ways in which anti-Semitism and other forms of racism and discrimination can be weaponized in a contemporary hybrid conflict. Prior to the outbreak of the current phase of the war, uh, six months ago, when the Russians launched a traditional full-scale military incursion into Ukraine, we had already experienced several years of uh, what's called hybrid warfare, where uh, mil special military operations, proxy warfare, uh, propaganda, hacking, and various forms of aggression are combined in a way to in which to give the aggressor a certain amount of deniability, to combine various, uh, various aggressive acts in a way which doesn't require the resources of a full-scale war. And a large part of that was a propaganda war in which the issue of the Jews and of anti-Semitism played a, an outsized role. Now, before we get into what's been happening, I think it's important to point out one thing, that as horrific as the weaponization of anti-Semitism, as we've seen in this conflict, in which uh, false reports of anti-Semitism, propaganda accusing uh, belligerent forces of attacking Jews, as, as horrific as that is, it's important to note that it marks a very significant change from how anti-Semitism has been used in prior conflicts. Uh, if you, we don't even have to go to the Holocaust and the Second World War. Let's go earlier. The Russian Civil War was accompanied by the pogroms. The, uh, uh, the beginning of Polish uh, independence following the First World War was accompanied by pogroms. Traditional military conflicts in Central and Eastern Europe have always been accompanied by direct attacks on Jewish communities. And 
what's interesting in this case is that there's sort of a reversal, not that the Jews haven't been used uh, by the uh, belligerents on both sides as a weapon uh, or the issue of the Jews, but that rather than attacking Jews directly, each side tries to position itself as biosemitic, as the defender of the Jews and other minorities. So as horrific as what's happening is, in a bit of a sick way, it's an improvement because what we've seen We've seen some violence against Jews, but for the most part, we haven't seen attacks on Jews. For the most part, we've seen the instrumentalization of anti-Semitism. And I'll explain, I'll get to that in a minute, I'll explain how that's worked. Uh, but I'd like to start at the beginning. In late 2013, when then President Viktor uh, Yanukovych of Ukraine, who was a pro-Russian uh, politician from Eastern Ukraine, decided to cancel a planned association agreement, a trade agreement with the European Union. Uh, nobody really thought that this was going to lead to a series of events that would end up overthrowing the government and cause a nearly decade long war with Russia. At that point in 2012, 2013, Russia and Ukraine were very close. Ukrainians had relatives and friends on the Russian side, Russians had friends on the Ukrainian side, people crossed the border freely. And nobody really thought that anything like what we've seen happening in recent years would happen. And what was going on at that point is that when Yanukovych decided to cancel this association agreement, nobody really thought much would happen. And you had small numbers of students coming out to the central square in Kiev, the, uh, the Maidan, and protesting, and they were immediately put down by riot police. They were brutally beaten. And this was the catalyst for what became known as the Euromaidan or the Revolution of Dignity. And what happened is the violence against these protesters sparked a larger backlash in Ukrainian society against the corruption, against the uh, authoritarianism, against the pro-Russian slant of their own government. It wasn't that people wanted to separate from Russia as much as they wanted to be closer with the European Union. They wanted liberal European values. They wanted trade. They wanted open, uh, open borders. They wanted the ability to get uh, visas to Schengen visas. And as the protests morphed into anti-government protests and grew, the government increasingly cracked down on the protesters. And this culminated in early 2014 with the what's known as the Maidan massacre with over 100 deaths uh, by riot police shooting into the crowd. And shortly afterwards, President Yanukovych fled, left for Russia, and was officially voted out by the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada. And during this period of the Euromaidan, there was a legitimate concern that anti-Semitism was on the rise. Uh, the Russians were saying, were starting this type of propaganda that would continue to characterize the next decade. But at the same time, there were enough real incidents going on that people in the Jewish communities were worried. Several Jews were beaten up, attacked, put in the hospital, walking near local synagogues. The Jewish communities went into lockdown and people were worried. People were worried because one of the groups that was very prominent in the street fighting between the protesters and the riot police were members of the far right Svoboda party, which had about 7% of parliament as of 2012. And so the Jewish community was already worried about the rise of this far right party, which was expressly anti Semitic. And when they played an outsized role, even as a minority within the revolution, and several anti-Semitic incidents occurred, people naturally got worried. And at this point, the Russians come in, and the Russians start saying, you know, Kiev is being taken over by a fascist junta. Uh, you know, if we have to get involved to defend Jews and Russian speakers and other minorities from Ukrainian ultranationalists. And it was propaganda, but there, there, there was a core of truth, and people were worried. But 
once Yanukovych fled and the first interim government came in, yes, it had several representatives of the far right, but that only lasted until the first elections. And what was very interesting here was that once the anti-Russian patriotic type of political discourse was co-opted by more moderate center, right, and left parties that previously had not espoused such, uh, such views, the support for the far right crater and going from, and Svoboda went from about 7% of parliament to I think they had one, maybe two uh, representatives out of more than 400 MPs. But regardless of that fact, the Russians had found a line that they felt had worked and will work. And the reason is very interesting. Nobody particularly cares about the Jews as an issue. Anti-Semitism doesn't move the needle on people's emotions, but it is related and connected to an issue that does move the needle. And that is the memory of the Great Patriotic War, the Second World War. In the United States and in much of the West, the war is very largely history. It's still part of culture, it's still part of the zeitgeist. There's still movies about it. It's still honored the veterans, but it's not something we live with day by day. Since the fall of the Soviet Union and the beginning, or I should say the beginning of the Putin era in 2000, we've seen a revival of the Soviet era, cult of the Great Patriotic War. It's become part of the zeitgeist. It's become an integral part of Russian identity. And in order to capitalize on that, on that uh, feeling that Russians are once again fighting the fascists, fighting the good war, uh, which again has an impact on Russians much more than it would on Americans, uh, Putin wanted to frame the Ukrainians as fascists and as Nazis. And one easy way of doing that is by accusing them of anti-Semitism. Because what are the Nazis known for? The Holocaust. If you can show that the Ukrainians are attacking Jews, then you can delegitimize them. And this came in two ways. One was a concerted effort to connect contemporary Ukrainian uh, patriotism and nationalism to the far-right Ukrainian nationalism that uh, many Russians are familiar with from the Second World War, the uh, prevalence of groups like the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the UN, and its built-in offshoot, the UPA. These were also known as Banderites after their leader, Stepan Bandera. These were far-right fascist movements, which collaborated with the Germans and were responsible for the deaths of thousands of Jews. And depending on which historian you ask, it's uh, not a hard and fast number, but up to 100,000 ethnic Poles. So the Russians really wanted to connect in their people's minds, the Russian leadership, Ukrainians are Bandarites and Ukrainians are anti-Semites. And this type of propaganda started very, very early. Uh, in March, 2014, when the first, was it February? In the beginning of 2014, when the first uh, unmarked Russian soldiers started to fan out through the Crimean Peninsula prior to the annexation, uh, there was a rabbi of a local reform synagogue near Tanit who got a call the first morning that the Russians started moving out from their bases. And he gets a call from a colleague saying, you have to go to your synagogue right now. It's been, there's anti-Semitic graffiti out there. And he shows up and he sees anti-Semitic slogans and the symbol, the logo of the far-right Pravi sector movement. Now, there was a problem with this. One, Pravi sector was not active in any way in Crimea. This was more of a central and Western Ukrainian uh, movement. They had no, uh, no presence in Crimea. Two, their logo was drawn backwards. And three, it only showed up after the Russians came in. So the rabbi was very suspicious and he started to think it could be a a provocation on the Russian side. Now this feeling was strengthened when he announced that he didn't want to live under Russian control and that he was leaving. And he made 
some very public statements against the Russians and saying that he's getting out of Dodge. He gets a call from representatives of Russia Today, the English language Russian propaganda network. They say, we'd like to film you leaving and interview him. And for some reason, he said, okay. And uh, they sent a reporter from their Tel Aviv bureau, actually, of all places. And she shows up in Crimea. She interviews him. Uh, a little while later, they air the, the segment. And instead of showing him saying, I don't want to live under Russia, I'm getting out of Dodge. They have him going, I'm scared of Ukrainian nationalism. The Ukrainian nationalists are taking over. It's scary to be a Jew. It's dangerous to be a Jew. I'm leaving. Now, that didn't make a lot of sense, given that the Russians had just taken over. But there it was. And I remember the rabbi telling me afterwards that he's not a drinker, but he really wanted to get drunk after that. And this was the became sort of a light motif in Russian propaganda going forward. Uh, not long after, there, I remember seeing an article in Izvetsia stating that members of Pravi sector had carried out a pogrom in the port city of Odessa and that they had been up 20 Jews around the city and that this local Jewish leader had called on the World Jewish Congress to come and intervene. Now, what was interesting is that this local Jewish leader cited in the Russian media didn't exist. There was no one by this name. Nobody had ever heard of him. I remember calling up uh, a community leader in Odessa and going, I was sitting in a newsroom, the newsroom in Jerusalem, I was going to call him up and I go, hey, was there a pogrom in Odessa? And he had him turn, uh, shift his weight, turn to the guy next to him, go, hey, was there a pogrom here? And he turns back, no, no pogroms here. What about in Jerusalem? And this happened again and again. Uh, Russian television ran stories talking about how uh, Jewish schools and newspapers were being shut down, how Jews were fleeing out of the country. Now, eventually, there would be a lot of Jews displaced and a lot of Jews fleeing. And we'll get to that. But at this point, I'll say that I interviewed over a period of years, a period of years dozens upon dozens of Jews leaving Ukraine. I did not ever meet one who said he was because of anti Semitism. But as I said, we'll get back to that. So we have the Russians going over and over, uh, painting the Ukrainians as anti-Semites. Uh, state media, social media, uh, official statements by, uh, by the Kremlin. And this kind of drumbeat of propaganda was answered by a counterattack on the Ukrainian side. The Ukrainians, embarked on what they called a campaign of decommunization following the, uh, the beginning of the war. Uh, after, the, after the annexation of Crimea, the Russians instigated uh, proxy, uh, proxy wars in eastern Ukraine in the, uh, in the Donbass region along the Russian border, a uh, highly Russophone uh, area. And they had these local proxy forces bolstered and funded by the Russian Federation and uh, backed up by Russian tanks, anti-aircraft, and troops. And this gave them a sort of deniability saying, you know, we're just helping local self-defense forces. Everyone knew what was really happening, but the Russians didn't want to look like they were directly involved. And until invading earlier this year, they always denied that they were involved. Now, the Ukrainian response was to embark on decommunization, as I said. So decommunization was this effort to take Ukrainian narratives, Ukrainian historiography, Ukrainian identity, and extricate it from Russian historiography, Russian identity, Russian culture. They had been embedded one in the other for so long. And the Ukrainians said, we're separate people, we're under attack. We do not want Russian influence. And part of this was to engage in a type of memory politics that has become typical of the post-Soviet sphere. Uh, we see this from Hungary to, uh, to uh, Lithuania. And that is to go back before the communist period 
find militant figures who fought against communism, against Russia, against the Russian empire, and to whitewash them and bring them up as heroes. So while Ukraine was certainly not fascist or anti-Semitic, it did try to rehabilitate members of the UN and the UPA, figures like Stepan Bandera and Shukhevich, and even prior to them, people like uh, Simon Pitlura, whose forces killed tens of thousands of Jews during the, uh, during the Russian Civil War. And it wasn't anti-Semitic in intent, but it was anti-Semitic in effect. And this is something that made the local Jewish community very uncomfortable because at the same time that this was going on, local Jews were becoming increasingly Ukrainian in their outlook. Um, the interviewing that I did over that period in Ukraine showed that many local Jews went from thinking of themselves as post-Soviet Jews or Jews in Ukraine to Ukrainian Jews. Uh, patriotism swept across the country, but at the same time, there was a certain reservation, a certain uh, anxiety over this cult of Bandera, which, to be fair, was only mostly popular in the west of the country rather than in the eastern parts of the country. There's a big linguistic and cultural divide, not as big as some people would say, but it exists. But part of this decommunization effort was passing a bundle of laws called the Decommunization Bills in 2015, which called for the glorification of these groups and made illegal their denigration. And as a result, he started to see this government-funded body, the Institute for National Memory, headed by a uh, avowed banderite, uh, Vladimir Vyotrovich, pushing a new historiography on Ukraine. And this really played into the hands of the Russians who used it to claim that the Ukrainians were going increasingly anti-Semitic. Now, during this period, to be fair, we did see an increase in anti-Semitic vandalism. Uh, there were multiple, uh, multiple attacks on the Bobby Yar Memorial site. But for the most part, local Jews felt safe. I recall speaking to one Jewish activist from Eastern Ukraine who had been displaced by the fighting. And he told me about an incident. He was in uh, the Eastern city of Dnipro and an anti-Semite came on the bus and started yelling at him, Jid, Jid, get off, we don't want you. Praying for Ukrainians. And he was booted off the bus by the other Ukrainians saying, we don't need people like you. We don't want people like you. So there was, you know, sort of this shift in a way, even with this uh, approach towards trying to rehabilitate uh, Nazi collaborators, there was a shift from an ethnic Ukrainian identity to a civic Ukrainian identity. And I think that could be seen very well by the role that some high profile Jews played during the initial phases of the war. Uh, during the first phase of the war, when the Ukrainian forces were corrupt, and ill-armed before they became the more professional force we see today, uh, many uh, local governors and oligarchs helped to raise private militias to fight against the Russians. And one of these was Igor Kolomoisky, a uh, Jewish oligarch and a philanthropist who was appointed the governor of the Dnieper region and raised a private militia and in essence became a Jewish warlord, quite using his own private troops against the, the Russians. Uh, we saw during the Petro Poroshenko administration, right after the uh, right after the revolution, his first prime minister that he appointed was an ethnic Ukrainian. His second, Groisman, was a Jew. And what was remarkable is when Groisman was appointed, his Jewish identity didn't matter. People criticized him for being appointed because he was a technocrat and a loyalist to Poroshenko. They criticized him for legitimate political reasons, not because of anything I do with his ethnicity. And we saw this again in 2019 when Poroshenko was booted by the, out by the much more moderate uh, Vladimir Zelensky, a Jewish comedian uh, and former associate of Kolomoisky who ran on an anti-corruption platform. 
and Zelensky, a man who became famous by playing a history teacher who accidentally became president of Ukraine, finds himself winning with over 70% of the vote, with almost none of the talk about his ethnicity at all. And so the reality of what was happening in Ukraine was very far from what the Kremlin was describing. At the same time, you did have a growing willingness to tolerate certain far-right groups. The problem was, as I said, the Ukrainian army in the beginning was a mess. It was corrupt, it was ill-organized, it was ill-armed. So whatever sort of militias were able to be formed to fight would be tolerated and accepted. And one of these groups, which played a major role in Russian propaganda, was the Azov Battalion. It was a far-right movement linked to neo-Nazism, whose leaders and founders were former members of far-right Nazi groups like Patriot of Ukraine. And they uh, ended up fighting in the Mariup Mariupol district in southeastern Ukraine, just outside of the Donbass. And Every time the Russians wanted to point to Ukraine being fascist, they would point to the Azov Battalion. And by the same token, groups related to the Azov Battalion and other far right groups in civil society, while they had very little representation on a political level, were tolerated and sometimes even funded by the Interior Ministry uh, until. About a year ago, the interior minister was a man named Arsen Navakov, a man with very tight ties to the far right, who used those ties for his political uh, benefit. Now, he has since been uh, fired by the Zelensky administration uh, and replaced. And it looks, and since Zelensky came in, we've seen a, a very strong downpedaling of glorification of the far right. We've seen, you know, the ties to far right groups uh, shrunk. And really, he's managed to undercut a lot of the Russian propaganda, at least in the eyes of the West. The Russian propaganda juggernaut is kept barely on. Now, the next development in Ukraine that was seized on by the Russians for their propaganda was the exodus of Jews from Eastern Ukraine. Now, when the Russians started taking over uh, the Donbass region, the Lugansk and the Donetsk uh, oblasts in Eastern Ukraine, uh, this had a very negative impact on the Jewish communities and on Ukrainians living there in general. Donetsk, within a very short period, lost about half of its population at one million. Most of the Jews of the city left. Most of the Jews of uh, Lugansk, left, Lugansk left, and they weren't leaving because of anti-Semitism, they weren't leaving because of oppression, they were leaving because it was untenable to live there. The war displaced vast numbers of people, and even those who were not displaced were forced, often forced to leave because of the economic collapse attendant on the conflict. And during a period of uh, four years, from 2014 to 2018, you had over 30,000 Ukrainians who made Aliyah to Israel. And this exodus really was a boon to Russian propaganda. They would say over and over, see the Jews are running. Why are the Jews running? And as I said, I've interviewed just dozens upon dozens of refugees. I've never heard one say that it was about anti-Semitism. But what the reality is, and what the Russians are going to say are obviously two different things. And this was one of the major tragedies of the war that the Russian attack, which was ostensibly to help Jews and other minorities, caused a massive displacement of tens of thousands of Jews and saw the establishment of some of the first Jewish refugee camps since the Holocaust in Europe. It was heartbreaking. I would go to these camps in, uh, I went to one of the camps in Jotomer, I went to another one in, near Dnepro, and to see these people who had lost everything uh, except the shirts on their backs uh, was just 
devastating. And the local Jewish community did what it could. The Russian Jewish community was sending in money to people who were Jews to help. But it was really a, a disaster. And it was a disaster that people didn't really pay all that much attention to at the time. During the current uh, round of fighting, since the most recent invasion, we've seen Jewish organizations get highly involved to a degree that they did not previously. And that's where things were left off prior to the beginning of 2022. The last time that I was in Ukraine was right before the beginning of the pandemic when international air travel was shut down. I was there in January, 2020, and I went to visit a synagogue in Kiev called the Kedem community. It had been founded by an Israeli rabbi, Pinchas Vyshevsky, a uh, Chabad Hasid, who had decades ago moved to Donetsk and helped reestablish organized Jewish life in the city. And when the war started, he hung on as long as he could there before being forced to flee himself. And he recreated a new community in Kiev for Jews displaced from Eastern Ukraine and from Crimea. And it was this beautiful new synagogue, community center, and he was running a whole kosher organization out of there. And it was wonderful to see the reestablishment of Jewish life. And it was not to last. In the beginning of this year, many, many people were surprised at the extent of the Russian advance into Ukraine. I personally, when it started on February 24th, was shocked because I had been expecting a limited operation in southeastern Ukraine to link up the already occupied areas with Crimea, to move down the coast, link up with Crimea, say, okay, that's it, and it's done. And this massive incursion, I think, took many people by surprise. And, but one thing which took many people by surprise, but which I rather expected, was the justification. And the justification that Putin gave was the denazification of Ukraine. It was only surprising to people who had not been following his rhetoric since the beginning of 2014. And this rhetoric was immediately, immediately received pushback from the Jewish community. But the Russians have kept at it. And as part of this denazification, ironically, the Russians have caused massive damage to Jewish sites. They uh, rocket landed very close to Babinyar in Kiev. Another rocket hit and destroyed a Holocaust memorial at Drobitsky Yar outside of Kharkiv. They have destroyed a Hillel house. They have uh, caused damage to synagogues. And Holocaust survivors and Jews have been killed. And yet this rhetoric continues because it works. If you paint the enemy as Nazis, you can motivate your own side. And this has continued and continued and continued despite the reality on the ground, which is the main damage to Jews and other minorities has been from the Russians themselves. And one of the ironies here is that while those of us in the West can look at Ukraine electing a Jewish president and say, this undercuts the argument that the Ukrainians are Nazis, the Russians have a very different take. Russian propaganda has shifted slightly to say that any expression of Ukrainian identity, any uh, Ukrainian patriotism, any insistence that Ukrainians are a separate people with a separate language, a separate culture, and a separate literature is in itself Nazism, is in itself anti-Russian racism, is Russophobia that we've seen in Russian state media over and over the idea that the Ukrainians are wayward Russians with no right to their own identity. And that Ukraine not only has to be denazified, but has to be de-Ukrainianized. And 
This combined with the large number of war crimes we've seen, attacks on innocent civilians and civilian infrastructure, has led the Ukrainians to go on a counteroffensive property in the wise and accuse the Russians of genocide and Nazism. And this is where we stand at the moment. Uh, I'm on I'm on uh, Zoom. Sorry about that. And this is where we stand at the moment, with both sides accusing the other of genocide, of Nazism. But I think it's fair to say that there's only one side that's actually engaging in, really engaging in war crimes and the type of instrumentalization of Jewish people that could be construed as anti-Semitic. Uh, so that's, as I said, that's where it stands at the moment. One of the ironic things is that the Kremlin, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, expressly said that the uh, that Zelensky is a Nazi, that Hitler himself had Jewish blood, and that Jews can be the worst Nazis. Uh, when Israel and Ukraine pushed back on this, uh, the Kremlin doubled down by putting out a long statement quoting several Jewish activists and academics. Uh, state trying to explain why a Jew can be a Nazi. And when that happened, I was very amused because I looked at this statement from the Kremlin and I realized that I knew several of the people that were being quoted. Uh, they quoted three main sources, two Israeli and, and uh, one Ukrainian. The Ukrainian source they quoted was a Jewish activist from Kiev, Edward Dolinsky. Uh, he runs a small NGO, which you could sort of class as maybe the Ukrainian equivalent of the ADL. And he's very highly critical of uh, decommunization and glorification. And he has been very critical, but he's a Ukrainian patriot. And I called up Edward and I go, did you say these things they said you said? He goes, no, I didn't. I never spoke to them. This is a lie. Same thing, they quoted two Israeli sources. One was the Israeli uh, diaspora ministry, whose spokesman at the time was a personal friend of mine. I call him up. No, we never spoke. Uh, what the, the stuff that they're quoting that we put out doesn't mean that. And they quoted an academic, a Holocaust scholar from, uh, from Tel Aviv University, Dr. Javi Dreyfus. Same thing. The, 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 the Russian approach has always been to take a core of truth, attribute it to someone with credibility, and decontextualize it or recontextualize it to make it look bad. So I certainly think there's what to criticize about Ukraine's approach to its history. Uh, in the same way, we, but what we have to keep in mind is that when the Russians say what the Ukrainians are doing expressly means that they're Nazis or anti-Semites, it doesn't really mean that because the Ukrainians, what they're doing is part of a larger context we see this in Poland, we see this in Hungary, we see this in Lithuania. It is a dynamic which is regional and which doesn't specifically point to anything anti-Semitic in Ukrainian society itself, which if anything has become more tolerant in recent years. Uh, I think what I'd like to do now is to open it up to questions if that's okay. And I'm sure everybody has things to ask. Very good. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, 